Well hello Internet and welcome to part three of my Learn to Program tutorial. In this tutorial, just like the previous ones, we're going to get progressively better at programming by solving problems and learning how to solve problems. And in this tutorial specifically, I'm going to talk about exception handling, do while, math functions, floats, strings, and a whole bunch more. And if you haven't watched any of the previous tutorials, you pretty much have to because these problems get more and more complicated as the tutorials go on. So there's a link in the description to those as well as a link to a cheat sheet and a transcript of this entire tutorial. So I have a lot to do, so let's get into it. Alright, so here we are in PyCharm again, and maybe you remember from the last tutorial whenever I talked about receiving input. I'm also going to now go and automatically convert everything in the input wise. Remember whenever we type in input and ask for information, it comes back as a string and now we're going to automatically convert it into an int instead of doing that on one line. And here I'm going to say please enter a number. And then I'm going to hope that they actually enter the number just like that. And then I'm going to show you in a second how to force them to enter a number. And then down here I am just going to print out the number that they entered. So let's just say number. And then we can go and we can run it and it'll say please enter a number but what happens if they put an A in there? Uh oh, all kinds of errors are issued on the screen. So how can we protect our code so that they are forced to enter a number? Well, one thing we can do is we can use something called exception handling. And what exception handling is going to do for us is we are going to basically state that we know this problem could happen and we want to handle if that does happen. So we want to go and we want to cycle through and continue asking them for numbers until they enter one. So one thing you can do with a while loop is put a true statement inside of there, put our colon of course, and this is going to force it to continue asking for a number over and over and over again until we guess think about how we're going to get out of the while loop if this is going to loop forever we can use a break statement okay so there's one question we got now what I can do is I can say I want to try to do this knowing that there's a potential for an error and then what I'm going to do is break out of that. So we're, that's how we're going to be able to leave our while loop. Well then what we do is we come down here and say except if there is a value error, which means that we wanted them to enter an integer and they went and entered a string instead. And inside of here we can handle that. And how we're going to be able to handle that exception is we can say something like you didn't enter a number and then it's going to jump up here and ask them to please enter a number again. Now that is an exception that has a specific error that we're looking for. What if we don't know what the error could potentially be but we don't want this gigantic mess to spill out all over the screen. We can just type accept with nothing inside of there and it's going to catch every single error. Not a good thing to rely on however you want to pretty much know what the error is going to be so that you can give a logical response. Because in this situation I'm going to say an unknown error occurred. And then after that we know that they entered a number and we could say something like thank you for entering a number. Now if we go in here and run this and they type in a letter A it's just going to say you didn't enter a number and now we can put in a 1 and it's going to say thank you for entering the number. We're going to get more into exception handling later on as the tutorial continues. Just wanted to briefly get you caught up so that you are well versed in exception handling and simple things that we can do to correct potential errors. But as the tutorial continues, we'll get more and more complicated. And now it's time for our first problem. What I want you to do is implement what is called a do while loop. Now Python on its own doesn't come with a do while loop, but it's pretty easy to set one up. And the basic format of a do while loop, if you don't know, is they always execute the code at least once. And then at the end, they check if a condition is true that would warrant running the code again. And the basic format of a do while loop is you're going to have do, and then you're going to have a bunch of code, followed by a while condition, and then whatever the condition is. So it's going to hit the do part, it's going to execute this code right here, and then it's going to check to see if that code should be executed again. Now I want you to create a do while loop, and hint, 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 you're going to go and you're going to use a while statement in much the same way as you did previously. 
And on top of that, what I want you to do is create a guessing game in which the user must choose a number between 1 and 10, and it's going to have the following format. It's going to say something like guess a number between 1 and 10, and then they're going to enter a number, and you can say something like 1, and if that isn't correct, it's going to ask again. And then you could enter a number, something like 7. And in that situation, if 7 was the number, it's going to put a message on the screen that says you guessed it. Now, once again, if you don't get it right, don't worry about it. What we're doing here is we're building up a base of how to solve similar problems. And that is the whole reason for this tutorial to exist. And the hope is, after you see these common ways to solve common programming problems, after a while they'll stick in your head and in the future you will know how to do them. But give it a good little test here and see how it works out. If you'd like another little hint before you jump in, you're going to need both a while loop as well as a break statement. And hopefully you can get it that way. Otherwise, now I'm going to show you exactly how to solve it. Okay, so we're going to create a storage cell in a variable for the secret number they have to guess. And then I'm going to type in while true, just like I did in the previous part. And then I'm going to say guess is equal to int. Now you could use your exception handling here, but I want to focus in on getting this as brief as possible. Of course, in the real world, you would use exception handling to make sure this is done right. 1 and 10. And then we're just simply going to come in and say if guess is equal to the secret number. Then in that situation, we'll say print and you guessed it. And then here's the break statement that I told you about. And that is all you're going to have to do. And if we come down here and run it, we can come in and go 1. It's an ask again, 2, 3. And then if we type in 7, you guessed it pops out on the screen. So hopefully you got that right. And if you did, don't worry about it. We'll get more into it. And you'll get much better at solving problems like this in the future. Now I want to jump over and go through a whole bunch of different math functions that are available to you with Python. All right, so every time I go and talk about math functions in a programming language, everybody says I dwell on it too much, and I want to make this tutorial full of a bunch of problems we could solve, so I'm going to go through this very quickly. And, of course, if you have any questions, leave them in the comments section. I answer all my comments. Now, one thing to know here is that Python is going to provide many functions with its math module right here. And you can see a whole bunch of them right here. And because we used the import statement right here, you're going to access methods by referencing the module. So this is the module, and there is the module right there. And I'll go through exactly how all of these are going to work for us. So basically, ceiling is going to round up this value. And if we go and we run this, we can walk through exactly what's going on. So we have ceiling here, which is going to round up to 5. Floor is going to round down. This is how we get the absolute value, which just knocks off the negative sign. We can also calculate the factorial, which is just multiplying all the different numbers up to the number that you provide. This is another way that we can do like modulus division, where we do a division and then get our remainder with F mod. Truncate is going to basically just uh, receive a float and return an integer, as you can see. We can calculate the power of two numbers. We can get the square root. There are special values that are built into Python, like e and pi, and you can see those right there. You also do e to the power of whatever you provide right there, and this should be exponent. A little bit of an error, no big deal. We can also return the natural logarithm, and I just provided a little bit of information in regards to how natural logarithms work in mathematics. If you don't want to worry about the math part of that, don't worry about it. We're also going to be able to define the base of this number and exactly how those calculations take place. They're also going to have a whole bunch of different trig functions as well as hyperbolic functions that are available. And of course, these are going to just receive a value just like that. And then finally, you're also going to be able to convert radians to degrees and also degrees into radians. So there's a rundown of some math functions. Feel free to get the code in the description. Of course, it's free and play around with those if you'd like to. But what I'm going to do instead is show you more accurate ways that we can perform floating point calculations because I received a whole bunch of questions about that topic. Now I'm going to talk about the decimal module, and I'm going to import it in a different way. Instead of import, I'm going to say from decimal, import, decimal, 
as, and I'm just going to make this D. Now with from, you're going to be able to reference the methods or functions that are inside of the decimal module without the need to reference the module like we had to with math, meaning previously we had to type math.floor or math.ceiling or whatever. Also, I demonstrate here that we can create what is called an alias, being D in this situation, and this is going to allow us to avoid conflicts with methods with the same name. So now what we're going to be able to do is do a little bit better calculations. So we're going to say sum is equal to D, and then inside of here, I'm going to put a zero. And now I'm going to perform a calculation that you saw previously that went wrong, and I'm going to show you how we can do it the right way so that we can get more accurate results. 0 0.1, and then we're going to add this up again, throw that in there a couple more times, and throw it in there one more time. And now we're going to change this to negative and make this 3. And then what we're going to do is print out the results. So we can say sum like this is equal to and then the value of sum. And then to show you what it works like without the decimal module, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, and then we'll see the results of that calculation as well, like that. And we can save it and run it, and you're going to see right here. Whenever we use the decimal module, everything comes out perfectly fine. Otherwise, we get this stinky result that you see right here, which is not very good. So there's a way to perform calculations using floats that is more accurate, and you can play around with that on your own. But now I'm going to jump over and talk about strings. Now text is going to be stored using the string data type. And by the way, there's a way that we can figure out the type of any different type of variable or basic value. We can just type in type and that's going to provide that to us. And we can also go type and throw a float inside of here. And another thing that is good to know is whenever you are creating strings, it doesn't matter if you use double quotation marks or if you come in and you use single quotation marks. As you're going to see here in a second, so let's change that to this and that to that. And if we run it, you're going to see right here that this is an int, this guy right here, this is a float, and both of these guys are represented as strings. So very important to know. And now let's go and create a string. And I'm just going to call this sample string. And I'm going to give this a value of this is a very important string. And don't worry, you're going to get some problems here in a second. Now each character is going to be stored in a series of boxes that are going to be labeled with index numbers. And you can get a character by referencing that index. So we can come in and we could say sample string. Everything in programming or a lot of programming is based around the concept of storing things in boxes because that's the way computers store things. And if we run that, you can see that T comes in right there and T starts this out. So it starts off at the zero index, one, two, three, four, five, six, and so forth and so on. You're also going to be able to very quickly get the last character in our string by just typing in negative one like that and you can see the G pops up right there. Another thing that is interesting is we would also be able to add indexes inside of here. So we could go three plus five, and you can see that A comes up inside of there, and you could also have a variable in B inside of here and then add five to it and so forth and so on. And you're gonna see more examples of that as the tutorial continues. We're also gonna be able to come in and get the string length, which is gonna be very useful if you're going to wanna cycle through a string. How you do that is type in len for length and sample string. Let's do a couple more of these. We're also going to be able to get a slice by saying where to start and where to end. So we can come in and we can go sample string and then this is a slice and we'll go whoops let's get rid of these quotes inside here and just print this stuff out on the screen just to keep it nice and simple. So if we want to start at the zero index and we want to slice up to the fourth index but not include it that's how that's done and if we run it you can see the length is there and we were also able to get this and print that out with the slice we can also come in and get a slice that's going to start at this index the eighth index and then get everything thereafter and you can see exactly how that works for us we can also come in and join or concatenate strings with the, the plus sign. So we could say green and then eggs. 
and run that and that's going to work for us. We're also going to be able to come in and multiply to be able to repeat strings numerous different times. So let's say we have something like hello, put a space inside of there, and let's say we'd like to see hello five times. Well, that's how easy that is to do. And also we will be able to convert a integer into a string just by going num uh, string is equal to, and then we can put str4. So just like we were able to convert a string into an int with the int function that you saw previously, we're also going to be able to convert integers into strings using the str function. We can also come through and cycle through each character that is inside of a string. So we can say character, and character is just going to be a variable that's going to temporarily hold each character of the string to print out onto the screen temporarily. And we can go for character in sample string. And then let's say we want to print out all those individual characters. And you can say that all those individual characters printed out on the screen right there, right here, if you can't see that. And that's going to be very important for our little problem that's going to be coming up here. We're also, another thing that's kind of neat is we can cycle through characters in pairs. So we can say something like for i in, and this is another range function that's available to us. So what we're going to say here is we want to start at index 0, and we want to cycle through the total number of string characters that are available to us. However, because this is going to be a 0 index, this is index 0, we're going to subtract 1 from that. Because if we would come in here and say what's the length, it's going to say 31, but there actually isn't going to be a 31st index. So that's the reason why we're changing this to 30 instead of 31. This range is going to temporarily hold all of the different indexes for the string. Didn't make sense? Leave a question below. Um, like I said, I'm going to want to cycle through in pairs. So I want to get two characters each time instead of just one character. And then if I want to come in here and print out those different characters, I could go I and let's go and just add these together sample string and then inside of it like I said we can go and add, put some addition inside of there we can get that guy right there and if I run this you're gonna see that it's going to print everything out in pairs okay pretty cool and another thing that's going to be very important if you want to be able to solve the problem that's coming up is that you're going to have to know that computers are going to assign characters with a number that is known as a Unicode. And A, capital A, through capital Z, are going to have Unicodes of 65 through 90. And lowercase, A through Z, are going to have Unicodes from 97 through 122. And we can go and convert back and forth between these different guys. Let's go and comment these out so we don't get any errors. And it's pretty easy. We can just say something like print, and then we can say a is equal to, and we can go ORD and pass in the A. And this is going to give us the Unicode for A. And likewise, we're going to be able to come in and say 65, and then call another function that is called CHR, and we can change this to 65. And if we run it, you're going to see that the Unicode for the capital letter A is 65, just like I told you up here, as well as if we convert 65 from Unicode to a character, you're going to get A. And that is going to bring us to a pretty complicated problem. And that problem is going to be that I want you to be able to receive a uppercase string and then hide its meaning by turning it into a string of Unicodes, then translate it from Unicode back to its original meaning. So if you want sample input or output for this guy, it's going to say something like enter a string to hide in uppercase. The second part of the problem is going to be able to receive uppercase and lowercase letters, but we're going to start here just to keep it simple. So it's going to say something like enter a string to hide in uppercase. It is then going to convert that into just the Unicode numbers, and it's going to print something out like secret message. And let's say that they type in something like hide. It's then going to print out Unicode. So I don't know what the, all the different things are. Let's just say it's 34, 56, 78, and 90. 
Those are going to represent the four different characters that are inside a hide. So it's going to convert it into that. And then actually after it converts into that secret message, it's going to print out on the screen original message and it's going to print hide back out. But whenever we're doing it the first time, it's just going to receive all uppercase letters just to keep it rather simple and then it's going to perform all of those conversions. So that's what I want you guys to make. Go ahead and try and do it now or if you'd like a couple more hints, I will provide those to you. All right, so if you want a couple hints here, basically of course we are going to have an input that is going to say enter a string to hide an uppercase. Okay, so we're going to go and print that out there and we are going to store that variable. Next thing we're going to do is we are going to cycle through each character in the string. While we are doing that, we're going to store each character code in a new string. And that's going to look like this after it gets all those character codes. After we do that, we're going to print out our secret message like this. Print and secret message and then it's going to print out whatever the numbers are. So let's just say 34, 56, 78, 90, blah, blah, blah. It's going to be something different than that, obviously. Then after we do that, we are going to cycle through each character code to, at a time, look at previous examples here by incrementing by two each time. I showed you how to do this previously. Next thing we're going to do is I'm going to get the first and second for the two digit number because we're going to be converting these back into hide in this situation. So this is going to represent the H, this is going to represent the I, this is going to represent the D, and this is going to represent the E. I'm moving those around, sorry about that. After that, we want to convert the codes into characters and add them to a new string. And then finally, we're going to print original message, boink, and then hide in that situation. Okay, so there's even more hints. So jump in there and try and make this all on your own by pausing the video and writing some code. Okay, so I'm going to write the code now, and then you can check to see if you are right. I'm going to call this normal string is equal to input. And of course, you can go in there and put the exception handling inside of there, which would be great. So I'm going to say enter a string to hide in uppercase. And then I'm going to cycle through each character inside of our string. Another thing I'm going to do is as I'm going through this, I'm going to be storing our secret message. So secret string is going to be equal to, and I'm just going to put nothing inside of there. Then I'm going to cycle through each character. So for character in norm string, I'm going to store each character in a new string. Let's go ahead and put that down there. So that's going to be our secret string is going to be equal to. I'm going to go plus equal to so I can continue adding those. I'm going to convert into a string and I'm going to go call ORD with the character. So what this guy is going to do is it's going to get the character code whenever it receives the character and then it's going to turn that character code or number into a string just so it can save that as a string. After it's done with that, it is going to print out our secret message. So we'll say secret message and then secret string. Then we're going to do a similar thing whenever we're cycling through each character code and we're going to put normal string is equal to and I'll just put nothing inside of there. And then we're going to have to cycle through each character two at a time just like I showed you previously. So I'll say 4i in range. I'm going to start out at the zero index. I'm then going to get the length of my secret string and then I'm going to subtract one from that once again because the string length is going to come back as whatever the total length is and it's going to disregard the zero index so I have to subtract one to make up for that fact and then I want to get two characters at a time. I then need to get the first and second for our two digit numbers. So I'm going to go and go character code is going to be equal to secret string and I'm going to get the first index right there and then I'm going to add that with I plus one just like I showed you in previous tutorials and then I want to convert the code into characters 
and store them in the normal string. So normal string plus equal to character integer and character code is going to go inside of there. And then finally, we're going to, after we have all this set up, we're going to print out our original message. So print equal to original message. And that's going to be normal string. So we can save that guy and then come down here and run it. Enter a string to, what is this? Hide. I spelled that wrong. To hide. There we are. Let's run it again. Control R. Enter a string to hide in uppercase. We're just going to type in hide. And it's going to come in here. It's going to convert it all into the individual Unicode characters. And then it's going to convert it back from it. So hopefully you got that right. If you didn't, that's not a problem. Like I said, you want to learn these common ways to solve common programming problems, and that's how you get better and better at programming. Now, finally, this is going to be the super awesome mind scrambling problem. What I want you to do is I want you to make this work for uppercase and lowercase letters. Now, well, you may ask yourself, well, why doesn't it work that way originally? Well, remember the Unicode characters, capital A through Z, are going to be 65 through 90. Meanwhile, lowercase characters, A through Z, are going to be 97 through 122. Now, why would this cause a problem? Think about that for a moment. Well, if we go down through here and we look at our code, you're going to see right here that we're saying that we want to cycle through each character code two at a time by incrementing by two each time. That worked with uppercase characters because there were only ever two digits. However, with lowercase characters, there can sometimes be three characters or three numbers, and that would cause a lot of problems. Let's go through and let's run it and see exactly what type of problems that causes, just so you can see that. So we'll go and run it again, and here we're going to say hide like this, hit enter, and you're going to see that it doesn't print out the stuff. And you're also going to see the 100 and 101. What I want you to do is to figure out how to make this work for uppercase and lowercase letters by just simply somewhere inside of here adding one addition as well as one subtraction. And I'll pause and give you a chance to look through your code and figure out how to do that. And then after the break, I'll show you how to solve it. Okay, so basically the way we can solve this quite easily is I'm gonna come up here and undo this. What I would need to do is convert this into two digit values and convert this into two digit values. Well, it's actually quite easy to do that. All I'm gonna have to do is subtract 23 from that. And then I will know that the highest value this will ever be is 99. That's gonna cover my uppercase and lowercase values. And then all I need to do is come in here and get rid or add in that 23 whenever I search through to print out the regular values. So what I'm gonna have to do is come down through here and wherever we have secret string, right like this. I'm just going to come in right before that and I'm going to subtract out 23. Then once again, I'm going to come down here to the normal string and whenever I go to convert it back, I'm going to increase that value right like that. So hopefully you got that and let's come in here and we can type in hide and you're going to see that hide works just like that. So that's just a way of thinking your way through a problem so that you have the least number of changes and you wouldn't go through and do like checks like am I working with three numbers right now or am I working with two numbers right now the problems or the way to solve things are sometimes very very easy and we don't really get to them sometimes because we look at the problem as okay how am I going to work with two um, digit numbers as well as three digit numbers meanwhile we can just come in and convert them easily down into the two digit values and then add that value back in so that everything works perfectly. Okay, so hopefully you guys enjoyed this tutorial. Please leave your questions and comments below. Otherwise, till next time.